as a first step, we want to describe the solutions to the non-autonomous Cauchy problem via a certain family of operators that is called evolution family. The general idea behind an evolution family is to define a solution to the non-autonomous Cauchy problem by means of an operator family that we will call capital U. And this family takes two parameters, one parameter T that corresponds to the time at which we are interested in the solution and the second parameter, which I set now to zero because we want to map our initial value x0 to the value of the solution at the time t. If you are familiar with semi-groups, then an evolution family can be considered a non-autonomous generalization of one parameter semi-groups. Furthermore, suppose that we have a solution x at time s already available for some point in time s less or equal than t, we want our evolution family also to be able to map this solution to the solution on the point in time t. Repeating the same line of argument to our solution x at point in time s, we may write x of s as u s0 of x0 and then just copy uts in here and we are already at one of the core algebraic properties of an evolution family. We are now ready to formulate the first part of our definition for evolution families. So an evolution family is a family of bounded operators on a Banach space X that fulfills the following algebraic condition that we can already derive from what we saw below. Looking at the first part of our general idea, we see that if t equals zero, our evolution family should be the identity. And we can generalize this to hold for all points in time s, saying that u s comma s should be equal to the identity on our Banach space x. The second algebraic property is visible from this last equation here, saying that basically it is the same to start with an initial value and use ut, comma, zero to map directly to the solution at point t. This is the same as going through the state x at time s with the evolution family u s, comma, zero, and then mapping from the point in time s to the point in time t. Algebraically speaking, this means that the evolution family u t s is the same as UTR, URS, for points in time S less or equal than R less or equal than T. Usually, we want our evolution family also to be strongly continuous, which means that for every sequence of pairs in time S and T n that converges to S T, we also want the values u, t, n, s, n, x to converge in the Banach space x to the evolution family evaluated at point x. And we want this to hold for all x in our Banach space, capital X. A further property that we sometimes want our evolution family to have is exponential boundedness. This is a property that you may also know from the theory of C0 semigroups in the language of evolution families. This means that we can bound our evolution family, UTS at X in the norm of the Banach space by a constant times the exponential function evaluated at some parameter omega times the time difference, T minus S for, of course, S less or equal than T. The last part of the definition takes care of the interpretation of an evolution family as a solution operator to our Cauchy problem. Namely, when we define our solution like this via our evolution family, we want it to be differentiable in some suitable sense and to solve the original Cauchy problem coming from the family of operators A of T.
we now want the following regularity property for our solution, namely that the, as a function of time, we want u of this variable to lay first in a Sobolev space, which now explains in which sense we want to talk about the differentiability on the interval from s to t with values in our Banach space x. This takes care of the left-hand side of this equation. And in order to make sense for this part here, we also want our solution to be in a L1 space on the interval with values in the domain of definition of our family of operators. For technical reasons, we also want a similar condition for the second parameter of our two-parameter evolution family. Coming back to our original problem of the final state observability, assume now that for our non-autonomous Cauchy problem, there exists an evolution family UTS exponentially bounded and related to our operator family A of T. We can now formulate this estimate using the notion of the evolution family. And we can now, in the next part, turn to our observation equation, because we will also need additional assumptions on our family of filters, C of T, in order to guarantee the existence of a final state observability estimate. One of these additional conditions is that we want our family C of T to be uniformly bounded. This means that with respect to the operator norm, C of T is less or equal than some constant delta. Last but not least, we will also need a family of operators that historically were indeed projectors on a Hilbert space, but now on a Banach space are just an indexed family. This family, P lambda, comes with a dissipation estimate and an uncertainty estimate, which we will take a look at next. Both these estimates come into play once we prefix our evolution family with i minus p lambda plus p lambda. The summit on the right can be estimated using the uncertainty estimate. It introduces a prefactor e to the minus lambda and also the operator c inside the norm. For the summit on the left, we introduce first with a little trick using the algebraic property of our evolution family an intermediate point of time laying between t and zero. Then the dissipation estimate comes into play in order to estimate i minus p lambda uts with this exponential decay factor and the rest remains inside the norm. In the next step, we use the exponential decay property in order to derive some kind of an interpolation estimate. And we see that we can estimate here in yellow on the left hand side the solution at time t by a constant times the solution at time s and the observation of the solution at time t. Now we choose a sequence that starts with L1 equals to our final time t and has a limit at 0. Plugging in the sequence in our yellow interpolation estimate, then using Young's inequality with an epsilon and integrating from Ln to Ln plus 1, we derive the following estimate. Note that this is a very sketchy proof. Some technical details are not considered in this video. The main point, however, of the above techniques is that after rearranging the terms in the above inequality, we get to a point where we can use a very simple argument, namely a telescoping sum argument. To this end, 
multiplying this inequality with e to the minus theta by 1 minus theta gives the following prefactor for the term on the left side of the inequality. And the same applies, of course, to this first sum on the right hand side, which you now bring over to the left hand side to derive this term. And the right hand side is what remains an integral from ln plus 1 to ln. What we have left out here are some constants in front of the both summons on the left hand side to, to the fact that all the inequalities that we have considered here are actually only true subject to a constant. Now, recall again what our goal was. Our goal was to derive an final state observability estimate. Now the idea is to choose epsilon accordingly and then sum over n. Then a telescoping sum argument and the choice of our sequence ln will give us our desired estimate. 